I think it was my dude Dean on Supernatural who once said, quote, Sometimes you gotta fight the fairies. And that's exactly what we're gonna do now. Sometimes the most remarkable things seem commonplace. I mean, when you think about it, jet travel is pretty freaking remarkable. You get in a plane and it defies the gravity of an entire planet by exploiting a loophole with air pressure, and it flies across distances that would take you months or years to cross by any means of travel that has been significant for more than a century or three. You hurtle above the Earth at a speed that kills you instantly should you bump into something, and you can only breathe because someone built a really good tin can that seems tight enough to hold a decent amount of air. Hundreds of millions of man hours of work and struggle and research, blood, sweat, and tears and lives have gone into the history of air travel. It has totally revolutionized the face of our planet and societies. But get on any flight in the country and I absolutely promise that you will find someone who in the face of all that incredible achievement will be willing to complain about the drinks. Yes, I was standing on nothing but congealed starlight. Yes, I was walking up through a savage storm, the wind threatening to tear me off and throw me into the freezing waters of Lake Michigan far below. Yes, I was using a legendary and enchanted means of travel to transcend the border between one dimension and the next, and on my way to an epic struggle between ancient and elemental forces. But all I could think to say between panting breaths was, yeah, sure, I mean, they couldn't have possibly made this an escalator? Hey, what's up, bookworms and Dresden fans? Mike back again to talk more Dresden Files. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about the fourth entry in the series, Summer Night. Now, uh, I, I actually did finish this one uh, a little while ago, and it kind of fell by the wayside as far as a review goes. But uh, keeping up my process of two per month leading up to the release of Peace Talks in July. So uh, I'm about, uh, I'd say about... 35, 40% through death masks right now. So I was like, before I get too far along, I want to make sure that I go ahead and uh, talk about Summer Night now before I get there. Now, before I start this, guys, once you know that my Dresden Files videos after the first two are all spoilers. So if you have not read Summer Night or you haven't read the first three books yet, I'd probably go ahead and turn away now. This was a decision that I made uh, on Long Running Series. It's like the first couple in a series. I'll probably do non-spoiler to kind of convince people to get into it. But after that... Uh, it's things that I need to unpack. I need to talk about this. So Dresden is just like my Wheel of Time or my Witcher videos where I'm going to kind of run through the plot and talk about what I thought while it was happening. So uh, if you do not want to be spoiled for what happens in Summer Nights and maybe some references to the first three books, I'd go ahead and bookmark this and come back after you read it. You know what, guys? These books are super easy to read. You can fly through them in a couple days. So uh, that really isn't like me telling you to, to bookmark my Wheel of Time videos and come back after you read it. I, I really do believe you can you can fly through these books rather quickly you know while I'm reading two per month while I'm reading other larger books so it's it's a it's a good time it's a good time and uh this that's a perfect way to open up talking about summer night this is a novel I believe that a lot of Dresden fans have ranked towards the top of their series rankings uh so uh I, I think I went into it with a little bit of high expectations and, and I'll talk about why maybe it didn't meet a couple of those. Maybe that's the reason why. I don't know. But I'll get into that as I go along here. But what we're going to do now is I'm going to talk about the plot. And I'm going to talk about kind of what I thought, again, while it was happening. So we start off right where we left off of the last book. Uh, the Red Court has declared war on the White Council based off of uh, Harry's uh, decision to uh, to invoke that war by uh, not listening to uh, Bianca's demands, uh, obviously, because Susan was involved. It made a lot of sense. Uh, if you guys, if you didn't catch my Grave Peril review... I did that right here, and that'll kind of lead you into uh, what's happening here. But uh, Harry, obviously, he's in a very, very big depression over Susan and her uh, her impending uh, vampirism. So uh, it kind of it kind of makes a lot of sense that this is where he would be. I'm glad they didn't just kind of shrug that off, and they kind of walk right into it. And it, you walk right into him walking into his apartment and finding Mab, the Winter Queen, in his apartment. And it turns out that she has purchased. Harry's debt from Leah. And uh, he says that she that he can go ahead and pay this off by doing her three favors. And uh, I didn't, first I'm thinking, well, are they going to do all three this book or is this going to be like a new thread? And I think it's going to be a, a new thread. Uh, it kind of makes me sad 
in a way because I was I, I really like the interactions with Leah and Harry. So I, I hope it's just kind of like a temporary thing. But um, you know, the first of these three favors is to find the murder of the summer night and uh, Harry does some thinking and he refuses he realizes okay look I'll do these three favors but I get to choose them and she says yes that is the case uh, but she's very very urging that she wants him to do this uh, meanwhile he is on trial by the white council for starting this war and um, they after uh, some some interrogation they demand that he accept Mab's proposal or else they will strip him of his wizard title meaning he will not be protected by the Wizard Council, and they can just give him to the Red Court as a peace offering to end the war. Really cool meeting Ebenezer. This is the fellow that uh, that kind of raised Harry after his whole situation with Justin and, and Elaine earlier. So uh, that, that's a nice uh, nod. Seems like a, a country boy, so to speak. Uh, always calls him Haas. And I think back to a high school coach I had that always called everybody Haas, and he was like full-on like he would wear cowboy boots with instead of cleats in the baseball team if he could have. Uh, Harry goes to check in on Murphy, and I'm thinking, okay, some some development because I thought Murphy was kind of absent in Great Peril. You know, she was just kind of like a MacGuffin in that one, and so I, I kind of appreciated that she had kind of a bigger part in this one. Am I thinking of the right book? Or am I thinking of Full Moon? I, the one where all all that she was was just like something to be. Uh, I guess she was just yeah, she was the last one because she was just sick because of nightmare, right? Uh, I believe that I believe that's a case. I don't know. These, I'm reading these so fast. I'm trying not to let them bleed together. But he checks on her. She's really down because she has found out that her ex-husband has passed away. And um, I've never been divorced, but I can imagine if you uh, if you have a divorce that doesn't end in just pure misery and you actually are still in good terms, that's going to tear you up a little bit to think that someone that you're married to passed away, even if you aren't on the best of terms. Now, I still think that's got to bother you a little bit. Dust bunny. <laughs> I guess I need to dust in here. Uh, and I've seen some people say that they have a problem with this chapter because... Murphy's like, oh, my husband died, and then Harry just goes on to talk about himself for a while. I really feel like a lot of current day readers that are reading this series now, it feels like they're just out to get Harry, and I don't know why. It's like maybe you guys are missing that this is a book about Harry, and if you don't like the protagonist, I don't know why you're reading book four right now. That's another tangent I can go off of for a while. I didn't have any problem with this. You know why? Because I wanted to know about Justin. I wanted to know about Elaine. And we finally get some of that backstory here that I have been waiting for since I believe the first book he mentions uh, Elaine and Justin. So uh, it was really good to get that backstory there. And it's uh, really kind of heartbreaking. And it's even crazier uh, what happens next. But I did want to say I, I thought that was a really good bonding moment between Harry and Murphy. I think I said after Full Moon was what I needed to happen going forward is I needed Murphy to stop trying to arrest Harry constantly. And it seems like, you know, they're actually becoming like friends at this point. So uh, I, I, I like that. I like that. I want to keep that dynamic. I don't want it to become like Angel and Kate did on the series Angel, where it was just like they were antagonistic at each other the whole time to the point to where the writers realized, hey, the fans hate this character and they just wrote her out. So I, I'm kind of hoping that they don't do that here. And, uh, you know, they don't have to be besties. They don't have to. They don't have to have any romantic relationship or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But I like the fact that they can actually be friends and talk about these things, even when she's hopped up on pills and alcohol. So this is the mind blowing moment uh, when Dresden returns home. He finds Elaine Mallory there. So up to this point, you presume that she's dead, and you just got this backstory. And I'm just thinking. I know a lot of people be like, "Oh, I saw that coming," because they were foreshadowing it there. Yo, he's been foreshadowing this since the first book. And you know what? The whole, I saw this coming crowd. Let me tell you guys about the kind of reader that I am. When I read a story, I'm along for the ride. I'm not trying to figure out everything before it happens. So that's why I'm not Mr. Oh, I saw that coming. Now, if it's really obvious that even I see it coming, sure. But I like to just kind of go for the ride on these books. I don't like to try to figure out everything because I don't have to wait years between the books. You know, obviously I'm binge reading it now. So I don't have this time. You think about something like A Song of Ice and Fire, where there's 28 years between books, yeah, you have plenty of time to think about these things. But with stuff like this, I'm just kind of going along with it. So that's why I'm not every comment about, oh, I saw that coming, I saw that coming. That's just not the type of reader that I am. But again, another tangent that I'm kind of going off of. But uh, she does explain that it was all Justin, and she never meant to betray Harry. And I'm not going to lie to you, I'm skeptical. I'm not buying a lot of that she's selling here. But... Uh, I guess we'll find out, right? It turns out she is working for the Summer Lady. Now, guys, this is where things start to get a little confusing on the first read. 
And I think it just stems from you need to know the differences and understand the differences between a lady, a queen, and a mother when it comes to these fairy courts. Now, if you don't, you're going to kind of be lost in this book. Okay, so the queen is the current ruler of the court. The lady is her successor and the next in line to be queen. And the mother is the queen that was and is like basically now retired kind of thing. This threw me off at first because, you know, Butcher, he throws a lot of names and titles at you. He's not really holding your hand anymore at this point. And I can appreciate that, but I'm not going to lie. I kind of had to start writing some of these down because I was getting all these names, all these knights. I was getting them all kind of mixed up, which belonged to which court and stuff like that. So I just made a quick little notepad and, and you know, it's nothing, it's not, we're not talking wheel of time here, but I'm just saying this is the first time where I feel like, yo, he's really not holding your hand anymore. And you got to kind of start to really pay attention to these characters and uh, this, uh, this, this court casting system and things like that. So once you get past that, I think you'll be fine. It wasn't super hard to understand. It just kind of jarring at first because you're like, wait, who is this again? We're not talking like Aes Sedai or nothing like here where all the names are exactly the same and similar. But they can get confusing and you can be like, wait, which side are they on? Are they winter? Or are they summer? I don't know. So once you get past that, I think you'll be good. Uh, Harry meets a group of changelings. Now, changelings they are half human and half fairy. And the downside of this is that they must fully embrace one side or the other to fully become that thing. Uh, until they do, they are the property of the fairy court. So these changelings hire Harry to find their friend, Lily. But Harry finds Elaine bleeding to death in the back of his blue beetle. And she insists that he take her to the summer lady, Aurora, who she's now working with. And uh, she heals Elaine. But, you know, she tells Harry of all... First of all, there's all the temptation and all that kind of stuff that always goes with it. Um, anything to do with the fairies is just everything is just about temptation with them. Uh, but he's able to resist. And she tells Harry of the upcoming battle between the summer and winter courts at Midsummer. Now, there's the point where I'm like, maybe I should have read Midsummer's Night Eve before I read this, because there's lots of references that people have read it, have said, yeah, yeah, it relates to this and this, you know, Butcher it and just making this up as he goes along. And, and I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. I just, I've just never read it. Um, so Harry decides he's going to talk with Leah uh, about this mess, and she uh, takes him to like this ethereal plane above Chicago uh, that it, it shows him this stone table which is what keeps the balance between the courts. And, you know, he gains an audience with these summer and winter mothers. And they kind of ask him riddle after riddle. And he finally is able to deduce, basically answering his own questions, that Aurora, she is the one who killed the summer night and transferred, transferred his mantle of power to Lily before he she turned her to stone. Uh, you know, they gift him this thing called the Cloth of Unraveling. Uh, it's supposed to be able to, you know, reverse any kind of curse or anything like that. So the first thing Harry's thinking of, obviously the first thing I'm thinking of is, whoa, he can use this to cure Susan's vampirism, right? Uh, yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. But I forgot to mention uh, before I get into this last battle here is there are some callbacks to other books. Uh, you get the, the alphas from Full Moon actually come back in this book. And Tommy, who I think just kind of had like a passing mention in Full Moon, he's kind of... Uh, first and forefront here, he's actually working with Harry on a couple of things. Like when there's there's frogs raining from the sky at the beginning of a book, and Tommy's there helping him when they actually like uh, evade an assassination attempt. Uh, he takes on a more prominent role, and and, and it's it's kind of hard not to like Tommy like right away. And I'm not gonna lie, man. Every time he talks about the alphas, all I want to do is play Dungeons and Dragons and eat pizza. So you can tell what Butcher's diet and uh, personal life was like at the time. But Harry enlists the alphas' help and the help of Toot Toot and his pixie army. Uh, they're they're armed with uh, with uh, blade cutters and, and you know iron obviously is very very bad for for fairies so it's 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 one of those kind of things if you can kind of get past the fact that there's pixies and fairies and you're not reading this kind of story if you're not into stuff like that uh, it, it's it's the part where it's like super cute but it's also just like oh man I'm glad this isn't a movie because I don't think you'd be able to get this past casual audiences but I love it. I love it. I mean, I'm loving everything about this series, so I don't have any any problems with pixies or fairies or anything like that. Uh, but this final battle takes place. Uh, Aurora plans to sacrifice Lily on this stone table, which would destroy the balance between the courts. And basically, Harry's able to use the cloth of unraveling to cure Lily of her petrification. And they are actually victorious in ending Aurora. And Lily is named the new summer lady. Now, Mab, after this whole episode, she offers, you know, as thanks, she offers Harry the role of new winter knights, but he refuses, and instead he goes to play Dungeons and Dragons with the Alphas as the imaginary credits roll, 
And does anyone else find it funny that an actual wizard and actual werewolves are playing Dungeons and Dragons together? I just couldn't stop laughing at that. Also, Harry plays D and D like I do. I just want like a, a barbarian that just is going to punch things in the face. I don't want to have to actually think about these things. So uh, again, a, a quick little read. Uh, like I said, there are some parts I think that will kind of confuse you if you aren't really paying attention. I feel like you've got to be more engaged with this one than you were maybe with with the previous. Uh, Dresden Files books. I've heard a lot of people complain about Full Moon because Butcher laid out like four or five different type of werewolves. Uh, if that bothered you, uh, all the, this, the, the whole fairy court thing will probably bother you because, like I said, you really have to place who all these characters are, who all their knights are, who all the ladies are, who all the mothers are, who all the queens are. You get the point. It, it can get very, very complicated. Now, I think that my problem really necessarily with this book is, like I said, I think people just kind of hyped it to the moon for me. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I don't find the fairies as, as crazy interesting as everyone else, uh, at least not their court. Uh, I, I like the dynamic between Harry and Leah, and that was, you know, basically a cameo in this book. But um, I don't know, I'm not as crazy into it as I think as everybody else does. And I like, and at this point, Great Peril is still my favorite book that I've read of the first four. Uh, I don't want to jump the gun and talk about Death Mask, but like I said, I'm liking it so far. I think it has the best beginning out of any of these books, but uh, I'll get to that probably in a week when I do my review for that one. But uh, again, I, I gave it a three out of five, and like I said, if you don't know my, my Goodreads rating, three stars means it's a very good book that I would recommend that you read. So uh, I, I give more books than not a three out of five. That's never a bad thing, as I think four is like something that's really, really impressive, and I, I think you should recommend it to anybody in the world. So obviously, uh, for me, three out of five is not a bad ranking. That is actually, like I said, mostly the standard in my grading system. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what happens next without talking about what has happened in Death Masks. Um, one of the problems I had with this is I got really attached to Michael in the last book. And then Michael was MIA in this book. And it kind of made me sad. And I know people have told me that his characters come and go through these books. And I get that. This is individual cases. Uh, this one, he wanted to bring back the Alphas instead of bringing back Michael and the Carpenters. I got that. It was just it was just a character that I really, really liked in Great Peril. And I really felt like I was missing his presence here because I really loved the back and forth between Michael and Harry. I think it was one of my favorite things uh, about Grey Peril. But I'm glad that they're still kind of slow rolling this uh, war with the with the with the red court and the white council uh, i'm hoping that kind of goes i don't know for a while in this series now but uh in february i do plan to do death masks and god what is book six called uh i, I can't remember all these titles I, I couldn't remember the difference between death mask and deadbeat when i did my last uh, weekly update video but uh whatever book six is i'm gonna read that and this back together while i'm working through wheel of time and Warbreaker. And how's I'm going to read Stephen King this month? It's funny that I picked the shortest month of the year to try to read five books in. Good times, right? Good times. But I do this for you guys. Uh, but anyway, what did you guys think about Summer Night? Uh, I, I'm not asking you to rank your series or anything like that, but if you were ranking it, would you put this kind of in the, 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 upper, the upper third or the bottom third or middle third? Where would you kind of guys place this at? These are the kind of things I want to talk about. So please, no spoilers in the comments after Summer Night. Anything from the first four books? Please, let's do it, and I will talk to you guys there.